Good afternoon. My name is Toby Jordan. I'm a director at Cliftecker Hofmeyer and I specialize in business rescue, restructuring and insolvency. I trust that everyone is safe and well during lockdown. I must admit that when I was getting ready this afternoon, I struggled to button up my shirt. Whenever I say to friends and colleagues that I specialize in business rescue and insolvency, they usually comment to say that I must be so busy at the moment. So I think that there's a lot brewing in the background, but that the big and let's call it the recession bubble has yet to burst. Therefore, we thought that it might be helpful to make use of the time during lockdown to provide training to our clients on topics relevant to companies facing financial distress and therefore causing a knock on effect on stakeholders such as creditors, directors, business rescue practitioners and liquidators. This is my first webinar and it's rather strange not to have a live audience in front of me. It reminds me of those maths and science lectures that we used to be on SABC3 where the presenters hands were so dirty and full of pen marks at the end. I promise that I will keep it clean today. The attendees are from different sectors and professions. Naturally, we don't have all the same level of experience and knowledge of business rescue and insolvency. Therefore, we try to put together a list of topics that will cater for everyone's interests. I ask you to look out for our weekly newsletters, which contains articles on relevant topics with a focus on navigating our clients through business rescue, restructuring and insolvency during COVID-19. The newsletter is published on a Tuesday afternoon. You would have all received an agenda for today's webinar, which serves as a framework for the discussions. You will note from the agenda that we've scheduled the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You are also welcome to post your questions throughout the sessions and we will attend to them at the end. We'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can. We are privileged to have Limkili Mondi and Renee Becker as guest speakers. They'll be joining us via video audio, oh, sorry, via voice audio, and we apologize should the quality not be perfect. I now hand over to my partner, Horsin Kaseng, to introduce Limkile to our listeners. Um, thank you, Toby. Um, unfortunately, we've had um, a bit of uh, technical difficulties and Lumkine is not yet with us. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask, can we just run with the program? Um, uh, and then um, as soon as he's ready, I'll let you guys know. Sure. Sure, no problem, Horsi. Um, if we then kick straight into, no problem, Horsi, if we can then kick straight into the first presenter and I'll hand over to my colleague, Kaleen Bayers. Um, um you're on mute. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry about that. I'm Colleen Bayes, and I'm a senior associate in the business rescue, restructuring, and insolvency team. And today I will be discussing with you how to prepare your business for COVID-19 and essential key points for businesses in, South in, in financial distress. Now, South Africa and the world at large are presently being rocked by the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the hardest hitting consequences of COVID-19 are obviously on businesses throughout South Africa, especially following the national lockdown by our government. Now, the implications of COVID-19 is that it is causing severe financial distress for many businesses in South Africa, big and small businesses. No sector remains untouched and businesses in all sectors have been hit very hard. It's therefore very important for companies to have a proper plan in place to navigate a way to restructure their affairs in these very challenging times. What I'm going to do now is to take you through 10 points that we believe are important for businesses to consider in working through these very challenging times. 
Now, some of them might seem very obvious um, and simple, but I think that a lot of companies find themselves in financial distress because they haven't actually gotten the basics right first. So the first essential point for businesses is to take a reality check. And you need to ask yourself the question, are you already in financial distress? And were you possibly already in financial distress before the coronavirus even hit South Africa? And this may be a very tough reality to face, but it is an essential starting point. I think many businesses in, in, in financial distress are in denial. They'll stop looking at their bills. They'll stop reading angry emails from creditors. But the first step is admitting that your business may be in trouble and that something does need to be done. So I think acknowledging the situation, looking um, it squarely in the face and, and taking action is infinitely preferable to putting your head in the sand. The next essential point for businesses are to ensure that your books and records are up to date. It is absolutely essential to determine your business's financial position right now and in particular to look at the extent of your assets and your liabilities and your monthly expenses. You need to know who your creditors are, what you owe them and when the amounts owing will fall due. You also need to check who your debtors are, what they owe you and when they are going to be able to pay you. A crucial point for businesses right now is to do the insolvency and liquidity test and determine if you are in fact financially distressed. So our 2008 Companies Act provides many helpful tools for directors to apply in these very challenging times. And Section 4 of the Companies Act is one of them where you can apply the insolvency and liquidity test. So a company satisfies the solvency and liquidity test at a particular time if the assets of the company fairly valued um, equal or exceed the liabilities of the company fairly valued and it appears that the company will be able to pay its debts as they become due and, um, and payable in the ordinary course of business. Now to apply this test directors will need to consider the company's financial information and financial statements. If it appears to be reasonably likely that you will not be able to pay all of your debts as they become due and payable within the immediately ensuing six months, or that the company's liabilities will exceed its assets within the next six months, then you are financially distressed. And these tests must especially now be applied more carefully and prudently. If a company is financially distressed or if it does not pass the solvency and liquidity test, then it is crucial that steps be taken to restructure its affairs. I must also point out that it's important to, to um, consider that determining financial distress has far greater consequences for a director than a simple balance sheet consideration. In terms of section 129 subsection 7 of the Companies Act, there's a very onerous obligation placed on the board of directors of a company where if the board determines that a business is in fact in financial distress, they are either to adopt a resolution to commence with business rescue proceedings. Alternatively, they have to deliver a written notice to each of their creditors, employees, trade unions and shareholders, setting out the reasons for not voluntarily commencing business rescue proceedings. Failure to adhere to the provisions of the Companies Act can result in a director being held personally liable for the debts of the company. So Section 77 of the Act actually speaks to this personal liability and explains that where a director knowingly carried on the business of the company recklessly or with the intent to defraud creditors or other stakeholders, that director may be held personally liable for any loss incurred by the company and section 214 goes even further to provide for criminal liability for those directors at the steer of a company which is being traded regularly. Another essential point for businesses um, is to talk to your insurer. So business interruption cover is an important insurance offering in both short and long term insurance for businesses. So Consult with your broker or your insurer to check whether you are in fact covered under your insurance policy. And if you are not, 
this gives you the perfect opportunity to address the lack of appropriate cover in order to mitigate the potentially disastrous results um, that a pandemic such as COVID-19 or other similar infectious disease could have on your business in the future. On to our next essential point for businesses, talk to your suppliers, your creditors and your customers. You have to have an open and honest discussion with your suppliers and creditors and see if you can work out an agreement on the best way forward. I found that most people are willing to work with you if they believe that you will eventually pay what you owe. So keep the lines of communication open and just remember that if you are not transparent with major creditors, the environment may become hostile. It's also important to concentrate your efforts on your business's best customers. So focusing on your most reliable and profitable customers can be an effective method of improving your cash flow. And then very essential, you need to gain the support of your bank by being open and transparent about the situation that you are currently in. I believe that if you if you proactively approach the bank and with a sound plan to improve your financial situation and repay that loan, then the bank is more likely to listen to you and to work with you. So and also just to remember that it's it's also in the bank's best interest to have you work through these challenging times so that you can remain a, a customer in the long term. Another essential point for businesses is to call in your outstanding debts. So it's often the case that businesses will allow their outstanding debts to go unpaid for significant periods of time, uh, potentially resulting in severe cash flow problems. A growth in the accounts receivable is a common cause of a company's insolvency issues. So I think a good practical tip is to, in, and in dealing with uh, late payments, um, is to contact your debtors with a reminder notice. Um, you could also consider in the future offering early payment discounts to increase the cash flow for your company. And if debtors still fail to pay, then unfortunately you are going to have to consider handing over the debt for formal collection. Another point is to cut costs. Okay, this is a simple one, but a very important um, point. Many businesses experience cash flow problems due to excessive spending. Um, this can be salaries or equipment or marketing or many other operating costs. So one way to increase cash flow is to cut costs and reduce the unnecessary spending. So this may mean disposing of non-key assets, unfortunately means letting go of, of staff and also importantly cutting the, the marketing spend. A practical tip is to make a list of all your expenses on a spreadsheet and go through it carefully, um, preferably with your accountant. And then look at it and go, how much can you save and where? You could also consider creating a document called a, a break even analysis, which tells you the minimum sales required in order not to sustain a financial loss. Another point for business is to remember that your mental health is important. It is a very stressful experience to have a business in financial distress and it can take a personal toll on you, especially if you've spent years investing in your business, a lot of time, money, blood, sweat and tears. It, it is a tough pill to swallow. And um, so I think that during these tumultuous times, it is very important to look after your emotional, your psychological and, and social well-being because it affects how we think, feel and act. And it also helps determine how we handle stress and relate to others and also make choices, very important choices in our business. So I would recommend for people to see a, a mental health professional or a doctor should they be in need of help. Our second last essential point is to use your imagination in crisis management. We need to accept that we may not be able to return to our familiar pre-crisis reality and we are probably not going to. Um, pandemics, wars and other social crises often create new attitudes, needs and behaviours which need to be managed. So our imagination, which is the capacity to create, evolve and exploit mental models of things or situations that don't yet exist, is a crucial factor in seizing and creating new opportunities and finding new paths um, for growth. 
Imagination is understandably one of the hardest things to keep alive under pressure and, and stressful situations, but I do believe that companies that are able to do so can reap significant value. With imagination, we can do better than merely adapting to a new environment. We can also thrive by shaping it. The last and very important essential point for businesses are to get help from insolvency specialists. I think a lot of businesses out there right now are considering their options and wrestling with the survival of their businesses and getting qualified help is likely to save you money and also your business in the long run. If you think your business is in financial distress or you know of uh, another company that may be in financial distress and you need some help with a plan of action, then our team at CDH are the very best people to talk to. Our team are experienced specialists in business rescue, restructuring and insolvency law. We would be very happy to have an initial consultation with you to help you understand your business's financial position and what options you have available going forward. Obviously, during the lockdown period, we'll be conducting all of our consultations online. We really can and we really want to help you during these trying times. And just from my side, a, a conclusion um, is that we need to accept that COVID-19 is one of the most extraordinary and disrupt disruptive life events of our area of our era. And I do think that it's one of the greatest challenges that South Africa has ever faced and will ever face going forward. And government has launched various support and relief measures that are currently being implemented in order to try cushion the economic effects of COVID-19 and to assist in, in ailing um, businesses. And although these measures, measures will keep some businesses alive and, and keep some people employed, I really do believe that the economic pain is still going to bite really hard and continue to do so for the uh, foreseeable future. So we need to accept that we, the way we interact and do business going forward is going to drastically change. Um, and life and business on the other side of COVID-19 will be a, a new normal. And South Africans will need to learn and adapt to a new way of life and doing business. But like I said earlier, this shouldn't just be about adapting. This should, this should be about thriving in these new circumstances. And for me, the light at the end of the tunnel is that a pandemic is always temporary and we'll eventually come out on the other side to pick up the pieces and start rebuilding again. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Stefan Fenter. Thanks, Colleen. I will be in on financial stress and the essential points for businesses in financial stress to consider. Uh, good afternoon to all the listeners from my side. Uh, let's immediately delve in and start by looking at exactly what business rescue is. Business rescue is defined in the New Companies Act as proceedings to facilitate the rehabilitation of a company that is financially distressed. Now, the way in which business rescue proceedings facilitate the rehabilitation of companies is by creating breathing space for the company under rescue, by allowing it to reorganize and restructure its affairs, assets, equity, debts, property and liabilities. Before we deal with some of the specifics of the business rescue process, um, it is important to take note that business rescue could have one of the following two objectives. Firstly, to restructure the affairs of the company in an attempt to ensure that the company continues in existence on a solvent basis. Or secondly, if it is not possible for the company to continue in existence on a solvent basis, that the business rescue results in a better return for the company's creditors and shareholders than would ordinarily result from the immediate liquidation of the company. It is important to be cognizant of the fact that in order for a company to be rescued, only one of these two objectives need to be met. Therefore, even if it is clear that the company which will be placed under business rescue will never trade on a solvent basis again, there could still be a reasonable prospect of the company being rescued um, if the business rescue will result in better returns for the company's creditors and shareholders um, than if the company was placed under immediate liquidation. Now, in order to achieve these objectives, 
chapter six of the Companies Act provides certain tools, uh, which include the following. The temporary supervision of the company and the management of its affairs, business and property uh, by a business rescue practitioner. A temporary moratorium on the rights of claimants against the company or in respect of property belonging to the company or lawfully in possession of the company and the development and implementation, if approved, of a business rescue plan to rescue the company by restructuring its affairs. There are two ways in which a company can be placed under business rescue, uh, namely by way of a resolution by the board of directors of the company in terms of section 129 of the Companies Act, or by way of an application to court by an affected person in terms of section 131 of the Companies Act. We will look at the definition of an affected person in a minute, um, but let's first deal with the requirements for a board of directors of a company to resolve to place the company under business rescue. Section 129 of the Companies Act states that a board may resolve to place a company under business rescue if the board has reasonable grounds to believe that one, the company is financially distressed, and two, there is a reasonable prospect of the company being rescued. Since Kyleen already dealt with when a company is financially distressed, I won't deal with this aspect any further. Instead, let's briefly look at how a board should decide whether there's a reasonable prospect of the company being rescued. The Companies Act itself doesn't provide any guidance on how to determine whether there's a reasonable prospect of rescuing a company. And one therefore needs to look at the case law in South Africa. In the Oakland Square Properties case, the Supreme Court of Appeal discussed this issue in detail um, and held that in order for there to be a reasonable prospect in existence, there has to be a prospect of the company being rescued, uh, meaning one of the two objectives that I mentioned earlier, uh, based on reasonable grounds. These reasonable grounds should be based on concrete and objectively ascertainable facts and will have to be considered on a case by case basis. Next, let's look at how a company can be placed under business rescue by way of a court order. Uh, the Companies Act states that an affected person may apply to a court at any time for an order placing a company under supervision and commencing business rescue proceedings. Now, an affected person is defined in the Companies Act as a shareholder or creditor of the company, any registered trade union representing employees of the company, and if any of the employees of the company are not represented by a registered trade union, each of those employees or their represent, uh, respective representatives. In order to succeed with an application to place a company under compulsory business rescue, the affected person must satisfy the court that there is a reasonable prospect of the company uh, being rescued and that the company is financially distressed or the company has failed to pay over any amount in terms of an obligation under or in terms of a public regulation or contract uh, with respect to employment related matters or it is otherwise just an equitable to do so for financial reasons. The business rescue proceedings will commence as soon as the business rescue order is granted by the court. Now when a company has been placed under business rescue voluntarily or by way of a court order, uh, there are legal consequences for a number of the company's activities and stakeholders, including its creditors. In short, the primary consequences of business rescue on stakeholders are as follows. Um, civil legal proceedings against the company, including enforcement action, are stayed until the end of the business rescue process. The disposal of the company's property is restricted the refinancing of the company is facilitated by allowing for unencumbered company assets to be used to secure loans. Employment contracts are protected, uh, opposed to liquidation proceedings where employment contracts will automatically be suspended. Um, and other contracts of the company may be cancelled or the company's obligations may in certain circumstances be entirely, partially or conditionally suspended by the business rescue practitioner. 
after a company has been placed in business rescue, a uh, business rescue practitioner needs to be appointed. Uh, if the company was placed under business rescue by way of a board resolution, the business rescue practitioner needs to be appointed within five days after the board of directors of the company filed the resolution with the CIPC. If a company is placed under business rescue by way of a court order, the court may appoint an interim business rescue practitioner who was nominated by the affected person who applied to court. However, the appointment will be subject to the ratification by the holders of the majority of the independent creditors voting interest at the first meeting of creditors. Uh, the effect of the lockdown on the appointment of business rescue practitioners uh, will be dealt with purely after me. Lastly, uh, I want to briefly deal with the development of the business rescue plan, which is one of a business rescue practitioner's duties as soon as he or she is being appointed. The plan has set out the manner in which it is envisaged that the company will be rescued and must deal with the background of the company, proposals on how the company will be rescued and assumptions or conditions, if there are any, upon which the plan is based. A business rescue plan that is adopted is binding on the company, the creditors of the company and every holder of the company's securities, whether or not such person was present at the meeting where the plan was voted on voted in favor of the adoption of the plan, or in the case of creditors, have proven their claims against the company. When a business rescue plan is adopted, if it makes provision for the company to be released from the payment of its debts to creditors, those creditors are not entitled to claim the balance of their claims against the company, even after the business rescue proceedings is terminated and the company is trading as a solvent company again. That's it from my side. Um, if you have any specific questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments section. Um, I now hand over to Toby, who will deal with when business rescue is the most appropriate mechanism for financially distressed companies. Thank you for listening. Toby, you're on mute. Apologies. We are still trying to get hold of um, our economist, Lumkili Mondi. We will continue to do so and we'll keep you posted. From experience, we've realized that it's very important for a company's board of directors to be honest with itself from the outset and to specifically pay attention to the following aspects, since a business rescue will most likely work under the following circumstances. First is if it's not left too late. Far too many businesses struggle on for too long and leave nothing to save. Timely intervention is essential, and this is a particularly difficult decision for owners who have invested so much time, effort and money into saving their business. However, the sooner appropriate steps are taken, the better. If it enjoys the support of the majority of creditors, and in particular larger creditors, such as the company's bank or major suppliers, a rescue could work. If these creditors are not on board, a company will most likely only waste time. Business rescue is a creditor-driven process. In many cases, creditors will assist if they sense that the data is being open as constructive proposals and that they have a chance of a better recovery if a business rescue plan is implemented. From both creditors and debtors' perspectives, early intervention is desirable. Most creditors are out of self-interest, interested in recovering as much as possible. Creditors who are well secured are less interested in the survival of a business, but they may support rescue plans if their security is not threatened. The next point is to consider if there is a real plan to save the business or at least a vi or at least viable components of that business. One must remember that business rescue is not a kick and pray exercise in the hope that something better will emerge during the rescue process. 
The most successful business rescues happen when the stakeholders sit down in advance and plan the rescue before initiating the formalities. This is referred to as the so-called pre-pack. However, this, must, this does not have to be inflexible. The time that the rescue process buys may lead to better variations of what was pre-planned as possibilities would emerge and there's less pressure to deal with them. One must remember that the business must be able to run, even if in reduced form, during the, during the business rescue process. This, of course, needs money, either from existing cash flow or reserves, or post-commencement finance. One must remember that from a creator's perspective, even if the business cannot be saved, assets may still be realized more optimally, economically and efficiently than would be the case in liquidation. So it's a better route to follow anyway, since creators control it. Stefan mentioned that I would address you on the appointment of business rescue practitioners during the lockdown period. I suspect that some of our listeners may be aware of a notice which was recently issued by CRPC in which they inform the public that for purposes of business rescue, a general extension is provided for business rescue proceedings which commenced but which did not complete the procedure as stated within Section 129 of the Companies Act until two weeks after the lockdown period or until CRPC communicates otherwise. Further, for proceedings that have not yet commenced in terms of Section 129 of the Act, those are the voluntary proceedings, DA's none will apply until, national lockdown, until the national lockdown period ceases. This created some uncertainty as to whether companies can file for business rescue during the lockdown period. I'm of the view that CIPC does not have the authority to extend or suspend the time periods contemplated in Section 129 of the Companies Act. Therefore, nothing would prevent companies to file for business rescue during the lockdown period and to proceed with the appointment of a business rescue practitioner. CRPC cannot refuse to accept documents that are filed with it electronically by email in respect of the commencement of business rescue proceedings and any ancillary documents that are required to be filed in terms of the business rescue procedure. So in summary, and irrespective of the recent um, notice received from CRPC, commencement date for the business rescue proceedings will still be the date that the resolution was filed with SIPC. This then concludes our portion on business rescue. I would like to remind everyone to, to ask questions by using the online commentary section on the right side of your screen. And I would now like to hand over to Hosin Gasing to take us through the liquidation guidelines for insolvent companies. Thank you, um, Toby, um, also to Carlene and Stefan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Hosi Ngaiseng and I'm a director at, at CDH. I'm going to touch on some high level key points re related to liquidation proceedings and perhaps now the board and management of a company after having taken steps, you know, to uh, take a step back rather to consider the position in relation to the various risks associated with um, director's liability and whether business risk is actually an option. It may well be that now it is quite clear to them that the company's financial situation is so dire and that, that there actually isn't even a reasonable prospect of rescuing the company. And perhaps the only option left is to liquidate. So where a company's financial uh, position is so dire to the extent that there's no longer actually able, uh, um, you know, uh, they're no longer actually able to continue trading, um, the appropriate course of action is a liquidation process. The purpose of liquidation is to wind up the company's affairs by selling the company's assets, either by way of a private treaty or public auction, in order to pay the cost of its winding up as well as its directors. 
Any residue thereafter is then divided amongst the company's former shareholders in line with their respective rights and interests in the company. So a company is said to be insolvent if its liabilities exceed its assets, which we know as factored insolvency, or if it, if it cannot pay its debts as and when they fall due, uh, that's that we know as commercial insolvency. Um, the latter is the more appropriate test for insolvency as you know, often companies are maybe factually solvent uh, while they're unable to pay their debts um, due to cash flow issues. So there are two ways in which a company can commence liquidation proceedings. So an insolvent company may be wound up either voluntarily or by the court. A voluntary winding up can either be a member's voluntary winding up or a creditor's voluntary winding up. Um, so with regards to the voluntary winding up, a company will be liquidated voluntarily if the company passes a special resolution resolving that it be so liquidated. The special resolution must thereafter be filed with the CRPC uh, together with several other prescribed forms and documents. The commencement date of the voluntary liquidation will then accordingly be um, the date that that special resolution is filed with the CIPC and um, the register of companies then will then have to um, uh, forthwith in, you know, deliver the, the registration documents, sorry, documents registered and the, uh, the resolution to the master of the high court. Some of the advantages of a voluntary winding up that it's, it's quick and it's simple and the process can literally be finalized within a matter of days. Um, however, one of the disadvantages is that, especially from a creditor's point of view, is that um, often you may find that creditors' rights are you know, frustrated in that they may not immediately know that the company has passed a resolution, has been liquidated. Um, with regards to the second option, which is the winding up by court order, what we also term as the compulsory liquidation, the company may be liquidated by a court order on various grounds um, which are set out in the, the Old Companies Act. Um, I think probably the most common ground um, which is frequently used is in, in instances where the company is unable to pay its debts um, as described in Section 345 of the Old Companies Act. Um, usually um, uh, that type of application will be preceded by a letter of demand to the, uh, to the debtor demanding payment within a period of 21 days in a failing which uh, the data will be deemed to be unable to pay the uh, to pay uh, to pay their debts, and an application to court can be um, either launched by um, any of the creditors or the company itself, um, or you know, any of the shareholders. And uh, the liquidation of the company by court order shall be deemed to commence at the time the liquidation application is uh, presented to court. I think one advantage um, of a winding up by court is the availability of the mechanism of an insolvency inquiry. And I think in certain instances as well, we see in practice that the appointment of a liquidator uh, by the master may happen quicker um, once you've actually um, managed to get yourself, um, you know, a, 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 the, the order um, confirming the liquidation of the company. Um, however, I think some of the disadvantages is that the process is quite expensive uh, because it involves the preparation and the issuing of a, a formal um, uh, application to the High Court, and um, the application may be opposed. And if it's opposed, um, uh, this may take some time um, to finalize. Um, I know as well there's been a, a practice directive that's come out of the DJP's office. Um, I think it was last Friday on the 17th of April, um, just dealing with how um, matters in court are going to be dealt with, I think, for the remainder of the second term, uh, which will take us to about probably the end of uh, June, July, I think. Um, and basically what it says is that you know, matters are going to be, have to be heard um, via video conferencing. Um, so whether it's opposed, unopposed, so, I mean, how this is going to work and whether or not it's going to be efficient um, is something we'll still have to, you know, to, to see, um, you know, with time. So I think that's just something also just take into account um, when um, considering proceeding, um, uh, you know, uh, with, the, with this route. As far as the appointment of the liquidators are concerned, um, the appointment, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is made by the master and the creditors or members will nominate a liquidator of their choice uh, by submitting their nominations to the master. And once the liquidator has been appointed, um, he or she will attend to the administration of the estate, which includes liquidating the assets of the company and thereafter distributing the proceeds um, to the relevant stakeholders. Um, once the uh, directors and management of the company um, have managed to sort of navigate their way through um, uh, the various processes of commencing liquidation proceedings um, and then taking steps to appoint a liquidator of the choice, I think it's quite important then to just take note of um, some of the sort of more important or primary consequences of um, placing a company um, in liquidation. So firstly, with regards to legal proceedings, all civil uh, proceedings which were instituted by or against the company are automatically suspended 
until the appointment of a liquidator. Um, and additionally, any attachment or execution put in force against the estate or assets of the company after the commencement of liquidation shall be void. So every person who having um, instituted, instituted legal proceedings against the company and which are suspended by the, uh, by the liquidation intends to continue uh, with those, they shall or must um, within four weeks after the appointment of the liquidator, um, give the liquidator not less than three weeks notice in writing before continuing or commencing with those proceedings. Um, if the notice is not so given, um, the proceedings um, shall be considered to be abandoned unless the court, of course, directs otherwise on good cause shown. As far as the custody of investing of the company property, so in practice, uh, we found that also there may be a bit of a delay in appointing a liquidator um, following the placing of the company in liquidation, either uh, by, uh, by resolution or by the court. Um, it is therefore important to note that at all times, while the office of the liquidator is vacant or the liquidator is unable to perform his or her duties, the property of the company shall be deemed to be in the custody and under the control of the master um, until the appointment of the liquidator has been made. With regards to uncompleted contracts um, to which the company was or had entered into prior to going into liquidation, in general terms, um, the liquidation of a company does not automatically suspend or put an end to the contracts concluded by the company prior to it being placed in liquidation. However, um, the, liquid, liquid, the liquidator steps into the shoes of the company and must, within a reasonable period, then make a decision whether he or she intends to perform in terms of the contract or not. And if the liquidator fails to decide uh, within a reasonable time, um, it will be assumed that you know, he or she has no intention of performing in terms of the contract. The liquidator cannot be compelled by the other contracting party to render specific performance in terms of the contract. Um, however, the other contracting party retains its normal um, common law contractual rights to cancel the contract after liquidation. Where the liquidator elects to not abide by the contract, um, the other contracting party will also have a concurrent claim for any damages that it may have suffered as a result of the breach of the contract. The next one will be uh, the effect of liquidation on leases. Um, so also yeah, where the company um, is a lessee of, of assets, and this is now in relation to both movables or immovables, um, in terms of a lease agreement, um, at the time of being placed in liquidation, uh, the lease is not immediately terminated, terminated by the liquidation. The liquidator must then, within a period of three months, after the appointment, make an election on whether he or she wishes to cancel or continue with the lease and must notify the lessor um, of the intentions by giving the lessor written notice to that effect. If the liquidator does, however, uh, not notify the lessor of the intentions within that period, um, the lease will be deemed to have been cancelled at the end of the three months period by operation of law. So until such time as the liquidator has made the election, uh, the lease remains in operation and any rental amounts which become due after liquidation must then be paid by the liquidator. And those rentals that become due after the date of liquidation um, to the date of cancellation of the lease um, will be treated as preference claims and paid um, as part of the administration costs. Any other claims that the lessor has as a result of the breach of the lease will then be treated as a concurrent claim. It must however be noted that um, well, notwithstanding the election available to the liquidator in relation to the continuance of, of the lease, the lessor retains its usual common law contractual rights, including the right to cancel the lease um, after the liquidation of the company, uh, where the company uh, was already in breach of the lease prior to being placed in liquidation. And then lastly, with regards to the effect on the employment contracts, um, well, look, the proposition that the liquidation does not suspend the company's uncompleted contracts is, however, qualified to some extent. And in this instance, um, the liquidation of a company will suspend uh, the employment contracts between the company and its, uh, and its employees with, uh, with immediate effect. And during this period of suspension, the employees are not obliged uh, to render any services to the company and um, they're also not entitled to receive their salaries or wages, nor do any of the employment benefits accrue to them. The employees may, however, be entitled to receive unemployment benefits um, from the date of suspension of the employment contracts. So, for example, from the unemployment insurance fund. The liquidator then may elect to terminate the employment contracts, um, but this must only be done after he or she has consulted with the employees and or any of the representatives in an effort to reach consensus on appropriate measures, perhaps to rescue the, uh, the whole or part of the, uh, of the company 
um, and consequently avoid retrenchments. This could be, for instance, um, where there's a possibility that the company or part of it could be sold as a, as a going concern, uh, in which instance then the employees would then be transferred over to the new employer. So all suspended employment contracts then not already terminated by the liquidator will automatically terminate 45 days after the date of the final appointment of the liquidator. Employees will then have a limited preference claim for a portion of their salaries um, and wages uh, uh, that are due but unpaid at the date of liquidation, um, as well as for any contributions which were to be made by the company on the employee's behalf. Um, any amounts in which remain outstanding to, uh, due to the employees or even above their preference claim will be treated as a concurrent claim. So that's sort of in a nutshell, uh, just the points I wanted to raise um, on a very high level um, um, related to, relating to liquidations. Um, we've got Renee Becker, who's the um, COO of uh, the um, Saripa, um, uh, and I'm going to hand over to her just to, to address us as well on a few issues. Thank you. Okay, I'm very privileged to announce that Renee Becker is up next. Renee is the Chief Operating Officer of Saripa. Um, and Renee is also currently an external examiner for the University of Johannesburg for the LLM in Corporate Law. And she presents the annual lecture on, in, on insolvency inquiries in terms of the Companies Act. She's also for a number of years presented the Diploma in Insolvency Law and Practice at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and Renee is just going to tell us a little bit more about Saripa and who they are, and also discuss a couple of practical suggestions that Saripa has made to the master. Okay. Good afternoon, Kylene, and everyone that has registered for the webinar and the presenters. Thank you. It's been most informative this far. It really is a privilege to join you this afternoon to tell you a bit more about Saripa. Saripa is a professional body. We are a not-for-profit company and Saripa stands for the South African Restructuring Insolvency Practitioners Association. We have two SACWA registered designations, one being the Insolvency Practitioner and the other a Business Rescue Practitioner. Our membership is wide and varied and um, not only IPs and BRPs, but we have accountants, bankers, academics, legal practitioners, and of course the ancillary services which providers which are so important, for example, insurance. We like to think of ourselves as a professional body and we work together to achieve our goal. We have an ongoing commitment to transformation and education. With the onset of the devastating impact of COVID-19, we approached the Accenture's master and we made a few practical suggestions to her. Yeah, you know, we understood that a balance must be found between safeguarding the house of all parties, but we had to, but we feel that there are certain functions of the master's office that have to proceed to prevent massive financial loss to our members and by extension the economy. One of the, our first suggestion is, of course, the confirmation of liquidity liquidation and distribution accounts. For those in the profession, though, that, that is where the IP fee, IP can only take its fee once, it, once the l and account is confirmed. And we suggested to the, um, to the acting chief master that this be done by email with our, in, with our members providing the outstanding requirements, um, as well as an additional affidavit confirming the date of the Inspection period and also confirming that no objections were received. All affidavits are supposed to be signed and commissioned during a teleconferencing, such as we are doing this afternoon with Teams or Skype or Zoom. You know, the problem is that so many affidavits are required that with a lockdown, it is a practical um, nightmare for members to get uh, the necessary uh, affidavit signed. Our second suggestion has regard to liquidation and distribution accounts. We also made the suggestion that the these accounts be lost by email for examination. And then queries from the master's then, um, you know, then issued and sent back to our members via email. Our third suggestion and one of the more important and one of the crises that our IPs are having at the moment is that um, meetings are obviously not 
not being able to be held because they were all cancelled via the regulations in terms of the BMA. Sorry, um, sorry, Renee. Sorry, can I just ask you to talk just a little bit more in the mic? Just a little yes, bit more. Of course. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, that's better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, much better. Um, just, to, just to take a step back, I said one of the the huge problems is, of course, the first meeting. Um, and I see no final appointment can be made before an, uh, a first meeting is held and closed. And the master has the uh, duty in terms of the Insolvency Act to convene first meetings. But it would appear that the government gazette, um, uh, the government printing works are closed. And that is a huge frustration for us at the moment. So we made the suggestion that um, all, you know, that the, uh, the government printing works offices be open so that we can, so that first meetings can be convened. We suggested that all meetings be convened to a date in the future. For example, the 15th of June 2020. But with a further protocol in place that should the lockdown be extending, extended, a meeting will be automatically extended for 14 days until normal duty is resumed. Um, we also made the suggestion that the master's office be open and staff work in shifts to accommodate um, our proposals. I've heard a rumour I have not been able to confirm, but I have heard that the Director General has requested the Master's Office to open during the final week of the lockdown. They will not be open to the public, but then they can resume their functions and, um, you know, just to, uh, to deal with the uh, workload that is obviously being piling up during the lockdown. Kylie? Yes, thank you, Renee. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thanks for thanks for being on the line. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Keep well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Renee. Um, still no connection with our economists, and I think what we should do is we should start dealing with the questions that came through on the Q and A event, and then maybe see if we can get hold of them at the end. The alternative would be that we slot them in for next week's webinar that will be hosted on next week Thursday. So the first question that, that came up, and unfortunately we won't have time to deal with each and every question, and some of the questions just also require a more detailed discussion perhaps, which can be addressed in follow-up articles that we will include in our newsletters. But the first question from Stefan Stein is whether there's been a reportable case whereby Section 129, Subsection 7 of the Companies Act has, was successful outcome on Section 1297 to hold the director liable for the debts of the company. So Stefan, not that I'm aware of, and most certainly not that I've seen, um, to be completely honest, is I've only seen one notice being sent out in terms of Section 1297. Um, the reason for that is that it's commonly referred to as a death notice because once that notice is sent out, it's an admission that the company is financially distressed, i.e. unable to pay its debts, and it's normally or could be responded to with a liquidation application. So I've never seen a Section 1297 notice being sent or a, or a successful application being prosecuted on that. Um, there was a question on how does business rescue work with trading divisions? So only a company or a close corporation can be placed in business rescue. So therefore, if a business consists of various trading divisions, if a decision is taken to place that company in business rescue, the entire company will be placed in rescue. And of course, the practitioner would then be able to consider the different trading divisions. Sometimes what happens is that your more profitable trading divisions are sold in order to get a cash flow injection in order to restructure your company. Or what they do is they put the company in rescue just to sell off the, the businesses that are not as profitable. So it's a holistic approach in a sense that you can't do a division specific. Um, then I'm going to ask Kylene to answer and to deal with a question that came on 
on what basis and under which circumstances can a practitioner terminate pre-existing contracts in terms of Section 1362 of the Companies Act? Okay, thank you, Toby. So in terms of 136.2, a practitioner can suspend contractual obligations on the part of a distressed company and the practitioner can also apply to court to, to entirely cancel um, an agreement um, on terms that are, are just and reasonable in the circumstances. And this section should actually be seen together with the, the purpose of, of the moratorium, which is to give a company some breathing space during the business rescue proceedings. And that is essentially the purpose that this section tries to, to serve. Because once business rescue proceedings commence, all contracts to which the distressed company is party remain in place. However, in terms of Section 136.2, um, a BRP is empowered to, for the duration of the business rescue proceedings, to um, extricate a company from very onerous contractual obligations that are preventing the company or may later prevent the company from being rescued. So I'll give you some examples of, of what we experience in practice. Um, for example, lease agreements with very high rentals or loan agreements with excessive interest payments, um, supply agreements with unfair pricing arrangements, service or maintenance agreements and the like um, are all possible for, for suspension during the course of the, the business rescue proceedings. Thanks, Toby. Thank you, Thank you Kylie. Um, there was a question on the effect of the lockdown rules and how would parties then call meetings of creditors and how would the affected parties come up at the bottom of the feed and I'm trying to deal with two questions at the same time. There's also a question then about how do you deal with your employees who sometimes don't have access to smartphones or internet and how do you communicate with them? So not that I'm aware of but in general there's no fixed rules set out as to how meetings should be convened. Um, my initial suggestion would be that if you need to have a meeting during the lockdown period, i.e. let's all hope that the lockdown is not extended again, and if you therefore need to have a meeting of creditors during the course of next week to discuss certain urgent business, the natural suggestion would be to have your meeting via a webinar, not a webinar, uh, uh, electronic means, so via a Zoom call. Um, I've personally attended meetings of creditors before where I was on a teleconference. It's not ideal because sometimes the quality is not as good, but it's possible and there's nothing wrong with doing so. So yes, during the lockdown you can most certainly um, still plan for meetings and still convene meetings, similar to what we're having now. Um, there was then a question on the impact of the national lockdown on the implementation of an already approved business rescue plan and the monthly payment obligations. So the way I understand the question is that if in terms of a business rescue plan, the practitioners have suggested to the creditors that certain or the debt will be repaid in monthly installments. And the question then comes up, well, if because of the lockdown and if the company is not an essential service provider and the company is not trading, Therefore, the company is not deriving any income and as such cannot pay its creditors. What impact would it have? It would be the same impact as, as in any business rescue plan, regardless of um, the lockdown or not, in the sense that the plan is binding on the creditors. There's a contract that was created and um, the company, through the practitioner, is obliged to effect and to implement that plan. And if it doesn't do so, then the creators would be entitled and would have a remedy available to them to liquidate the business or to apply to court to liquidate the business rather. I think people must just be more reasonable and I think there must be a reasonable approach to that. And of course, if the company cannot pay the monthly obligations because it wasn't trading, because it was forced to close down, then creditors should carefully consider their position because they've already the company's already gone through a rescue process whereby creditors voted and approved the business rescue plan which means that they support and they believe in the rescue of the business and give it some time, maybe go on a round two of the rescue process. But in short, the answer to the question is that once the business rescue plan has been adopted, it's binding between the company and the creditors and it becomes a contract. And you would then have to consider the rules of contract and how to apply any breach of a party's obligations on that contract. 
Um, there was a question on the appointment of a business rescue practitioner in the case of the board applying for business rescue and what the process is around the appointment. So as Stefan Fenter dealt with this in his um, presentation, I'll ask Stefan to answer this question. Uh, thanks, Toby, and thanks for the question. Uh, in short, the board of the company must appoint the business rescue practitioner um, when the board files for business rescue. Um, and this must be done within five business days after the adoption of the resolution to place the company under business rescue. Um, it's important to keep in mind that the business rescue practitioner must be someone who satisfies the requirements of uh, Section 138 of the Companies Act. Um, and then after appointing the business rescue practitioner, uh, the company must file a notice of appointment uh, of the business rescue practitioner with the CIPC. And this must be done within two business days after making the appointment. Um, and this will typically be done uh, in terms of CIPC form COR 123.2, uh, accompanied by the consent letter of the business rescue practitioner. Lastly, uh, the company must also then be aware that it must publish a copy of the notice of appointment uh, to each affected person within five business days after the notice was filed with the CIPC. Um, so yeah, thanks Derby. Thanks, Stefan. Um, there was a question about what happens to the remainder of the debt that the company owes upon liquidation. The way that I understand that question is that once you've submitted a claim and you've only received a 10 cent dividend or 10 cents in the rand of your claim, so the question is then what happens to the remaining 90% of that debt? So the first point of call would be to consider whether you have a surety in place for that debt or whether someone else did surety as security for the debt by the company that's been placed in liquidation. And if so, um, you would be entitled to enforce the rights on that surety ship agreement. Alternatively, if the company is the sole principal data um, and responsible for payment of the debt, um, unfortunately, after you receive your dividend, that portion will be discharged because the company will be dissolved on the liquidation upon uh, the finalization of the liquidation proceedings and therefore the liability will no longer be in place. Um, there were quite a lot of questions coming up through the employment issues in a business rescue process and also through a liquidation scenario and um, I, will, I, will, I will answer in them to the best of my ability not being an employment law specialist. Um, so I'll give short answers and I think what, what would be appropriate is to maybe identify these questions and to group them together in an article that we can include in the next edition of our weekly newsletter. But in short, a question was posed as to whether a company can run the Section 189 process concurrently with the proceedings of business rescue or during the liquidation process. So yes, of course, in order to um, the, the Companies Act is very clear and as well as the Insolvency Act that when you deal with your employees in a business rescue and a liquidation scenario that you, you must comply with the regulations set out in our Labor Relations Act. So yes, you can run a process concurrently. Then there were quite a lot of interest I see on the notice that was issued by SIPC on the DS9 and the effect of that notice and where the companies can still file for business rescue and, and how to go about the filing of the business rescue, which in my mind is a positive sign because it shows you that the that our clients out there are, um, are considering it, their rights and their obligations. It seems that the board of directors of companies that may be financially distressed are considering their fiduciary duties, specifically the duty set out in section 1297 of the Companies Act. I think what best to deal with the request is that Stefan and I are already working on an article that will be published in our newsletter, the edition for this coming Tuesday, dealing with specifically the CIPC notice and the DA's non-effect and whether you can file for rescue and appoint a practitioner in lockdown or not. So my suggestion is that we rather deal with and group all those questions together in that, um, in that article in the Tuesday's edition. There was a question about if a dispute should arise on the valuation of assets on either liquidation or business rescue. So in a liquidation scenario, 
the, the majority of assets are sold on a forced sale, forced sale basis. So your value is normally determined on a willing buyer, willing seller, and what willing buyers are prepared to pay for the asset. And there can't really be a dispute. Um, of course, if the if the asset is overvalued or undervalued, there would be certain rights for the create the creators of that company would have rights to approach the master and to approach the liquidator and to file objections and to say that the asset was not properly valued or was sold for undervalued by the liquidator because it would of course have the effect on the return that a creator would receive in a liquidation or in a business rescue scenario. So creators are not completely without remedies and if it would mean that the asset is undervalued, it can certainly be addressed. Okay. There was a question as to whether creators can claim assets that are owned by businesses in foreign jurisdictions. And the example was put that if um, there's a vehicle in Brazil which was purchased by the now liquidated company. And the question is then whether how do you go about getting your hands on the, those, let's call it foreign assets. It is most certainly possible. The question is a little bit more complex um, because there are different rules that will apply and different association and treaties between different jurisdictions. But in a nutshell, and to, and to get to the point of the question is that it is possible to trace those assets. As a start, what you would have to do is you would reckon you would have to recognize the liquidation proceedings in that foreign jurisdiction in order to be able to attach that asset in the foreign jurisdiction and to have it sold so that the proceeds can come to the liquidation and distribution account. There was a question on how employees claim is calculated and dealt with in a liquidation. And um, I'm going to ask Hossein Kassin to deal with that question. Yeah, thanks, Toby. I mean, just in very short, you know, the employees have got a claim you know, for all the arrear salaries, um, leave pay, severance or retrenchment pay. And what happens then is that um, a portion of the claim is preferent, um, uh, but that's limited to 28,000 Rand. Um, I speak under correction, I hope that's still the amount. Um, and then the balance of the claim then will be a concurrent claim. Thanks. Thanks, Fossi. Um, there's no question as to the difference between a, a sale by way of private treaty and public, and public auction and who decides on this route. Um, so ordinarily what would happen is if a liquidator wants to dispose and sell off the assets of the company in a liquidation, he would have to be empowered to do so. Um, powers are, liquidators' powers are typically extended and given at the second meeting of creditors only where various resolutions are adopted and placed on the table for creditors to consider and approve. But it is sometimes necessary, given the urgency of a specific matter, for liquidators to extend those powers at an earlier stage. Um, ordinarily, an application will be brought to the master or to the high court by the liquidator asking the master to extend his limited powers. Um, in that extension application, the liquidator will typically ask for both. So he would ask for um, an extension of his powers to sell property, movable or immovable, either by way of private treaty or by auction. Um, the reason why he would ask for both is that he would want to, and of course it would be one of the goals of a liquidator, to ensure that he sells, he or she, sell and dispose of the assets for as much as he possibly can in order to get as much proceeds in as he possibly can to settle the creditors. So it, it's, 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 I would say the answer is that the liquidator will decide on the route as to how to dispose of the assets because ultimately that's one of his duties to dispose of the assets and to liquidate the assets in order to pay the creditors. But typically it would um, be included in his extension of powers application. If there's no application, it would be through resolutions that are adopted at the second meeting of creditors. Okay, then the next question. Just trying to quickly see what the next one is. It 
So there's a question about how does business rescue affect a director's rights and duties under the Companies Act? So one must remember that as soon as the board resolves for a company to be placed in business rescue, the directors remain directors of the company. It's just that they no longer have any authority to act in the sense that all decision making will be taken place or will be done by the business rescue practitioners. And the directors are there to assist the practitioner in rescuing or trading or continuing with the business operations. But the filing for business rescue does not affect a director's rights or duties under the Companies Act. So an interesting question that is that is often that I've that often come up in a rescue scenario is what happens when a company is in distress and retrench the staff as part of a rescue proceedings, then they're not able to pay the severance packages. So once a company is retrenched, but once employees are retrenched in the business rescue process, the employee will become entitled to payment of the retrenchment package. The question then further goes as to whether that specific employee or that claim is it in a preferential nature in the sense of an employment related expense or claim or does that employee become a normal concurrent creator and the entitlement to be paid is just from the severance package or the severance agreement. Um, it's the same. My answer to that is that it's, it's the same as with any other creator that the company cannot pay in terms of an adopted business rescue plan. So if the plan Remember, through the plan, it would provide for the retrenchment of employees, or it could potentially provide for the retrenchment of employees, and the plan would have to provide for how payment will be made available for those employees. And if it's the same, and it's nothing different to creditors being paid their claims in the rescue and how the company will go about paying it. So if, if there's no money, it's the same as if there's no money to pay creditors, which is the same as the first questions that we that that one of the first questions that we answered as to what happens if the company can't make payment of those monthly obligations in terms of an adopted business rescue plan. And the answer is again that it goes back to the law of contract because there's a binding contract in place between your creditors and the company when a plan is adopted. There's an interesting question on the fees of a business rescue practitioner. So the business rescue practitioner's fees are set out in the Companies Act and there's a tariff that applies and it's a different fee for different seniority and also the size of the company. The size of the company is determined at the filing of the rescue when the board is required to indicate their public interest scoring because it affects the size. It's either going to be a small or medium or large company. Um, practitioners, however, are not bound by that prescribed fee structure. Um, often what you see is um, right at the beginning when the board meets up with a business rescue practitioner, remuneration agreements are agreed and um, set out right at the beginning of the rescue process. Um, sometimes it's also possible for practitioners to um, include uh, a success fee in a successful business rescue plan and it's been the topic of a recent decision in our Supreme Court of Appeal which allows for business rescue practitioners to be entitled to receive a success fee through a business rescue plan. Um, so yes, um, practitioners are practitioners fees are set out in the Companies Act. There is a, there is a straightforward tariff that is implied and can be applied but there are deviations to that rule. Then there's a question about whether business rescue practitioners are entitled to commission for the sale of assets. It depends on the relationship. It depends on the agreement that the practitioner has reached with either the company or the company shareholders. Um, but it's not as with a liquidation where there's a tariff set out where liquidators are entitled to a certain percentage or a commission on the sale of, for instance, immovable property, movable property or the collection of debt. Sure, then there's a question of the, the basic requirements to qualify as a business rescue practitioner. So the Act does assist in setting out those requirements for us. 
and it's dealt with in section 138 of the Companies Act under the heading um, the qualifications of a practitioner. Um, ordinarily it is that the practitioner must be a member in good standing of a legal accounting or business management profession. Um, he must be licensed by the um, by C by the commission. He's not subject to an order of prohibition. He's not disqualified from acting as a director and he does not have any other relationship with the company such as would lead a reasonable and informed third party to conclude that his integrity may have been compromised. So there must be some, some um, form of independence. So I just repeat that your requirements and the qualifications of the practitioner is set out clearly in section 138 of the Companies Act. There's a question on whether if the master has approved the L&D account, can the liquidator make, and the L&D is short for liquidation and distribution account, and whether the liquidator can make a short payment to creators, or are they obliged to make payments in line with the account? So um, advanced, there's a principle of advanced dividends that are being paid. Um, one must also remember that there, sometimes there are more than one liquidation and distribution account. And all these accounts must be approved separately. So you'll start off with a first liquidation distribution account, and in that account, the liquidator will propose to the master what proceeds he has received from the liquidating of the assets and how he intends to distribute the proceeds to the creditors. Payment must be made in terms of that distribution account and can't be short paid, but it's possible that a creditor would only receive these dividend on the second or the third approved um, liquidation account. There's another question on the CRPC extension notice that we will deal with in our article that will come out on Tuesday. Then there's a, a practical question I would imagine on the effect of lockdown on the process of serving a court order um, of a provisional liquidation on a company or on the employees. So that's, that's actually something that we are dealing with at the moment where we have a provisional liquidation order in place um, with a return day that's been set um, down in the lockdown period and um, in this specific jurisdiction where we are, the court has made the decision not to hear any um, matters unless it's urgent and there are certain, there are also again a list of requirements set out for matters to be classified as urgent during lockdown. Unfortunately, what we have is that um, the return day must again be extended because otherwise it will lapse and a second uh, application, a follow up application will then have to be brought to reinstate that um, provisional order. But unfortunately, we're sitting in a scenario where we cannot serve. We cannot serve our, our provisional order because the sheriff is not willing or can't assist us with the service. So it does have a detrimental effect. I would imagine that we may see a practice directive maybe coming out to this regard to assist and practitioners and attorneys in dealing with um, return dates that have been missed because of the lockdown period. Um, currently, currently I, I, I can't offer any other solution to that problem, but to at least provide assurance to the client that even if worst case scenario, that provisional order would lapse because it was not made final on the return date, there's always the option of bringing an application to reinstate Then there's a question about um, lease agreements in business rescue and whether that can be suspended. So the question is whether a contract of lease can be suspended by a BRP or payment of rental be suspended or reduced unilaterally by the BRP whilst the BRP continues to occupy the premises. And luckily over time we've seen some clarity on this question. We're right in the beginning of business rescue practitioners. Sometimes one of the main reasons for company adopting a resolution to place itself in a business rescue was to avoid making payment of its rental obligation and then to hide behind the legal moratorium and to say that they can't be evicted from the premises. 
So ooh, the case law has developed on that and cancellation of um, agreements have been seen not to be enforcement agreements or enforcement actions which are prohibited by the moratorium, which is set out in section 133 of the Companies Act. Um, the, the general rule of thumb and the advice that we give to clients on that is um, if there's a breach of an agreement, you follow the breach clauses of that agreement, irrespective of whether it's a lease agreement or any other contractual agreement that's in place, you give effect, you give notice, and you follow the rules of that contract, etc. Thereafter, you provide for the cancellation of that contract, and you then enforce your rights thereafter. If it is an eviction, you must obviously first ask the practitioner for his consent to litigate against a company that's under business rescue. And if that consent is not provided, then you can apply to court as a first pre in your application in the eviction application to then ask the court to uplift the moratorium for the specific circumstances and for allowing the landlord to institute proceedings against the company in business risk for its eviction. So there's a question on who must sign an agreement on behalf of the company on a business rescue and as I dealt with this before, it said only the business rescue practitioner is allowed to sign or contract or bind the company. Um, but however, what he can do is he can delegate that authority to someone else and he will then have to make sure that that is clearly set out. There's a question by one of the liquidators that we work with frequently. It's asking that if a BRP liquidates the company and the liquidator is appointed by the master who pays the administration costs or the contribution of the liquidated estate. And I think what the question means is that ordinarily when you when the applicant when an applicant creator applies for a company to be liquidated, he cannot dissolve himself from the potential risk of having to contribute to a shortfall on the liquidation proceedings. Um, so the question is then whether if the business rescue practitioner is an applicant in the liquidation proceedings will be out liable for that um, shortfall or the distribution and the answer is no but i can i can i can take this offline because it's quite a long and lengthy debate and various SEA decisions that can help us to resolve that Um, I'm going to throw this out to to one of my team members um, just because it's it's a rather open-ended question and maybe I must do the rounds again and, and start with Kylene because she dealt with the first question that I threw out and maybe ask Kylene to answer how long does um, a how long does the business risk proceedings last? Kylene, if you can hear us. On mute, Kalin. Thanks, Toby. So if business rescue proceedings do not end within three months, the practitioner needs to publish monthly reports to basically keep um, all the affected persons up to date with the status and the progress of the business rescue. Um, and it really does depend on various factors when a business rescue ends. Um, it depends on the size of the company, it depends on the complexity of the sector that um, that we're involved in. It depends on the uh, number of employees, the number of contracts on the go. Um, and so we have been involved in business rescues that, that do end um, within a, a couple of months. But most business rescues um, do take a lot longer. And so um, I think when the when the chapter six was drafted, they were very ambitious to think that that proceedings would end in three months. Um, and so generally, because we work on the more complicated business rescues, um, we have the companies in business rescues for up to uh, a year, sometimes two years, sometimes some of the more complex rescues. So there's no simple answer to that. Um, and like I said, it depends on various factors. Thank you, Kylie. And unfortunately, that's not always something that our clients want to listen to or hear when we say to them that sometimes it can take over two to three years before you'll get paid. Um, guys, I think that wraps up our question. Unfortunately, we were not able to make contact with our economists 
um, Lumkile Mondi. Um, I was really looking forward to, to hearing what he has to say about the effects of COVID-19 on our economy. Um, maybe what I can do is I can give you a little teaser. Um, we are going to try to get him Kile on at our webinar next week, Tuesday. Um, take the week to um, Google Mr. Mondi and to read up on him. You will you will maybe find some interviews that he's previously done on Carte Blanche. He is known to me, or I commonly refer to him as the Carte Blanche economist. So maybe do some homework so that we're all better prepared. And maybe as a as a sort of punishment, we can ask some difficult questions next week to our economists. Um, guys, thank you for joining us today. And um, I would like to encourage you to please sign up for our webinar of next week, Thursday at 2 o'clock. We will be sending out invites or the invite for this webinar um, somewhere in the course of tomorrow. We will set out the different topics. Um, in that webinar, we will look at directors' liability and the legislative, amend legislative amendments and regulations that have been put in place, as well as the impact that it would have on general court proceedings. I'm going to leave you to say enjoy the rest of your afternoon and let's hope that the lockdown is not extended again. Good afternoon.